And the next host is a senior news reader and is a main presenter of the BBC News at 6 and the deputy presenter of the BBC News at 10. And I have got the absolute and ultimate privilege that I'm proud to introduce and to, and to welcome Felicity Baker and Sophie R Raworth. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Um, well, it is a great pleasure to be here. I've, uh, I'm a sort of a late, late call up and I'm going to tell you very straightforwardly the reason. And Felicity is supposed to be chairing this on her own. Um, but about three months ago, we had a very random conversation in the newsroom after I spotted on Twitter something that she wrote about having her speech therapist and how she'd had a speech therapist since she was 11. And uh, I walked over to her. I'd been working with her really closely on two documentaries all year long. And I walked over and I said, you what? I've never heard you stammer. You've got a stammer? And she started reeling backwards and I started asking more and more questions. And we had this amazing conversation about her and stammering. And it turned out she'd never talked about it before. She's 36. Um, and I'm not sure if she regrets that conversation or not, because now she's about to appear as a presenter she's a producer normally and um, she's about to we swap roles and I've become her producer and she's now the presenter and we have indeed done this film that's going out on Wednesday night called I can't say my name stammering in the spotlight um, it was a, it started as a 12 minute well it started as a three minute piece on BBC News it then became a sort of could we do 12 minutes for the channel news channel um, and it, they liked it so much on BBC One they've now put it prime time so I hope we live up to expectations. But I have, I have pitched up this afternoon because Paul Felicity is now lined up to do endless interviews next week. And uh, having never spoken about her stammer, she's now got to talk to millions of people over two days. And I think it all became a little bit too much. And I offered to step in and sort of host this with her just to take the pressure off for a bit. So uh, anyway, Felicity, are you there? Good afternoon. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been um, it's been an interesting few months, I have to say, since we had that initial conversation. But I think when we we did that news piece back in January, I don't know if anyone saw that, but it's just about kind of living with what life's like for people who stammer. And we never expected a response like we got. It was completely overwhelming from, you know, in a really positive way. We just got hundreds of messages from people saying, you know this thank you for doing this you giving me a voice I've ne I also never speak about it so that was really amazing for me I'm very emotional I have to say the last few months have been very emotional but um making this documentary has been has been amazing but uh it's it's just it it's been it's it's just very very strange to, for me I'm still not used to kind of speaking about it to anyone apart from my speech th 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 therapist Carolyn who I know is on this so hello um but so just speaking about it is is still something I'm very much getting used to so um I thought I'd go the whole way and just broadcast it to um everyone. <laughs> but Felicity just explain as well because um I think I was just watching the messages come in just now and uh, Lynn Mackey and uh, John T took um answered her question but Lynn Mackey um I hope that's how you say her last name said asked she said that often stammering is portrayed in the media as either pitiful pitiable or, or people overcoming it. And actually this film is not about that, is it? I mean, we've gone right down the middle. Just explain why. I think, well, for, for me, I mean, I, you know, I, I just stam stammer there, but I actually very rarely stammer. If you if you meet me at work, people, I, I mean, Sophie is an example of that. I'm very good at hiding it, um, covert stammering. I know there are people here who will understand that. I avoid words, I avoid situations to such an extent where I appear fluent and if you if you met me you would never never norm, normally realize and I think for me I, everyone's experience of stammering is unique for me I never really meet other people or I never speak to other people that kind of go through that and kind of have the same avoidance techniques and what's been really amazing and making this program that's going out on Wednesday is just I kind of would sit down with people and say oh I, I do this and they go I do I do exactly the same it's kind of like, oh wow there are actually other people out there that do they just understand completely and that's been a real revelation for me and we didn't want to kind of you know do do this thing of stammering is what you can overcome because you don't overcome stammering I know that I appear very fluent but I will I will always stammer it'll always be a part of me you know a very part but it is is part of me and we just kind of want to you know bring, bring we just want to bring that to people's attention and the fact that you, there's so much under the surface that you never really 
see, you know, and for, for, for people like me, so much of it is in, internal. And I just wanted to raise, raise awareness of, of, of that as well and con continue that conversation. Well, we've joined this afternoon um, by a number of uh, people who are all going to be talking about uh, stammering in the arts. So let me introduce them by name and then I'm going to ask each of you to uh, just give us a sort of couple of minutes and just tell us about yourselves and your role and how uh, stammering influences your, your work in the arts or not. Um, so first of all is Paul Aston, who is an artist and who has just started uh, painting himself stammering. He's got his photographs on Instagram. Gina Rose, who is joining us, I think, all the way from uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco, I think, from California, um, who is a, a filmmaker, an extraordinary story of, um, she's a filmmaker who has written, directed, and produced her own film. Um, Danny Rossi, the cartoonist, who, whose cartoons I'm sure people will be familiar with, but uh, who has cartoons about a fox who stammers. Rory Sheridan, who's uh, introducing something called the Hiatus Collective, and will tell us all about that. And Helen Russ who has uh, been about a bit, I've seen her on television, she was on BBC just last week, um, who has written a book called The Boy Who Made Everyone Laugh, which is uh, based on her and her son's experience, her son who has a stammer. So welcome to all of you. And Paul, can I start with you, if you'd like to give us a, a brief introduction about yourself? Um, hi there, yes. Uh, uh, um, thank you. Um, 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 I guess that over the last... Um, um, a uh, fifty odd years of my life, most of that time, I've um, I've I spent uh, feeling that classic um, deep shame of a stammer. But this was um, 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 flipped on its head um, uh, um, a year or so back um, after I started attending with the Cambridge group, and um, um, and. Uh, and I started to see how my stammer had shaped my life, and um, uh, um, uh, um, and lots of those things were quite uh, positive. Um, so, um, um, and I thought, well, um, um, I've always been rejecting my stammer. And, um, and, um, uh, um, and accept it as an integral part of me. So, um, um, so, um, so I'm a painter um, and I started off with a, a self, a portrait of myself actively stammering. Um, um, and, um, and I wanted to I portray myself in uh, um, in a way that celebrated that side of me and um, and um, and integrated it into my myself. Um, at, at the idea partly came out of Sven um, Christiansen's work, who um, uh, 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 um, did photographs of himself and other people in, in Iceland largely um, in the act of stammering and he and he coined this term the the stammering aesthetic and I was just intrigued as to what my stammering aesthetic was so um so I, I painted myself stammering I, um, I posted it on in, on Instagram and I uh, quite like Felicity had uh, there once I'd um, I pressed the send button. I thought, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> but it, it was, um, um, but it was great, yes. And I got this wave of uh, um, uh, um, uh, positivity back and, um, and all of a sudden, people at uh, work, people from all sorts of aspects of my life started to ask me about the experience of stammering and um, um, and the best thing that they can do to, um, um, in everyday life to help there. And since then, I've started a project of painting our fellow stammerers and I view this as um, um, I, 
um, I, I have issues with words that begin with C, and this word starts with C and ends in um, elaboration. So I do that with other stammerers, and um, and um, I've started off with Patrick um, um, Campbell there, and uh, and we and we did this joint. Uh, a portrait which you can find on my Instagram site. I think that's quite enough. That's amazing. Of... I think your story is amazing. And I've looked at your Instagram site and your art is wonderful. And just before I move on to the others, you, as I understand it, you'd never spoken about your stammer publicly until now and you're in your 50s. And what, what effect, I mean, you say it's been sort of the, the wave of positivity. What effect has it had on you psychologically being so open about it and so public about it all of a sudden? Um, um, I... Um, um, uh, um, I just feel great at towards yes, and and uh, and I feel much more, um, um, I feel much more linked in with the wider stammering, um, our stammering community, uh, and I've had a chat with people from. Um, all over the, the world, about it from New Zealand, from South America, from uh, New York, all over the, the place. Um, so it's, um, um, it has been quite an uh, amazing experience. And also it, it has boosted my uh, confidence, which has uh, rather disappointingly made me more affluent uh, in the end. Yes, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's brilliant. Right. Well, I think I can see in the messages here, lots of people looking at your, your images already. OK, lovely to, uh, lovely to meet you. Uh, let's move on to our next panellist, who's Gina Rose, who is joining us from the West Coast of America, I think. Hello. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you? Very well. Lovely um, to see you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gina Rose. I live in Oakland, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've stuttered since I was four years old. I remember the exact moment that I had my first stutter and where I was and who I was with and everything. Um, and um, so I'm a writer and filmmaker and I just released my first feature film. It's called I Can't Sleep and uh, it's in its festival run now. It was just um, screened at the Boston Science Fiction Film Festival and it won best script there, which I was really, really um, happy and um, honored for. And I Can't Sleep, uh, the uh, tagline for the film is, a young writer struggles to complete her science fiction story while battling supernat supernatural forces in real life. Um, and I wrote, <laughs> I uh, wrote the script and um, I work in mental health outside of filmmaking and um, arts and things like that. Uh, so I uh, took on two jobs and I saved $10,000 to make this film, um, knowing that I have wanted to make a feature film since I was about 14. Um, and I figured I would give myself this chance. There's a movement called micro budget filmmaking, which I started reading about about maybe uh, four or five years ago. And um, you know, it's expensive to make movies. <laughs> But uh, that's how I um, raised the money for this and was able to make a micro budget film. In terms of my stammering, you know, also about five years ago, um, I think, well, I have stuttered since I was four and I was in speech therapy as a child and I was really good at hiding it, you know, coverts out there, <laughs> like really, really, really good. So much so that my own family was like, um, oh yeah, you don't really stutter. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, but it was really hard for me because I, I was hiding it every day and people didn't believe that I stuttered really. And um, I felt like, you know, I had to portray this image of who I was. And it, it, honestly, it took a lot of energy and a lot of creative energy <laughs> to do that. Um, about 10 years ago, I found the National Stuttering Association and I joined that community. I joined the local chapter here in the Bay Area and I went to my first conference. And um, it was through that community, I, I feel like I started to come to terms more with my stuttering and start to think, well, maybe there's a different way I can relate to this aside from you know, shame and hiding all the time. 
because um, I would wake up literally every day with 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 dread about like, oh man, am I gonna blow my cover today, <laughs> you know? Um, and then about five years ago, I, I started avoidance reduction speech therapy to help me kind of get more familiar with my stuttering and um, just kind of be more comfortable letting it out and acceptance of it. And it, I guess it was around that same time, I just had some shifts in my, my life where I felt like I kind of realized that stuttering wasn't letting me be authentic or like, you know, like hiding stuttering wasn't letting me be authentic in that way. And I really wanted that in my life, in my art, in my relationships, in just the way that I, you know, took up space in the world. So um, that's, I, I, I think, shifting that, that energy from hiding to something else, um, to acceptance, like kind of freed up a lot of stuff for me and kind of brought me to where I am now in terms of, you know, where I am about um, my art and everything like that. And um, so, yeah, I'm just really, really grateful to be here. Thank you so much. What an extraordinary story. And you, I mean, the thing when we made our film for the BBC, the thing that has really, and I knew nothing about stammering or stuttering as you call it in America. I really didn't know anything about it until, we, until a couple of months ago. And the <laughs> thing that has really struck me is the, the hidden aspect and also the energy and, you know, you saying even your family, I can see Felicity Baker uh, smiling on the screen because this is a story <laughs> she's told me as well. And that energy that is used to hide it and waking up, she, Felicity says to me, she wakes up every morning and thinks, how is she going to get through the day? She's a producer at the BBC. She had problems saying the word BBC because she didn't like the word letter B. How does she <laughs> make a phone call and say, my name's Felicity Baker, I work for the BBC. How do I get around that? And I said to her, it's, it must be exhausting. It is, it's totally exhausting. Yeah, yeah. And when you give yourself that space and freedom to kind of let go of that and just be yourself and let yourself talk the way you talk, I feel like um, it does open up other possibilities. So yeah, I'm definitely glad other people relate to that. Um, it's definitely I think a lot been of people my do. I want, I want to hear in a moment, I want to hear if you're using that that experience in your your movie making or you know if you're going to inject that, but let's, uh, let's meet the other people as well. Danny Rossi. Um, who joins us as well, the cartoonist, the fox who stammers. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm nervous all of a sudden. <laughs> um, well, um, I'm coming to you live from Toronto in Canada. My day job, I'm in digital, I'm in digital marketing, but uh, I've always wanted to be a cartoonist, specifically the newspaper style comics that never uh, left me was always a a hobby. Another dream of mine, speaking of the BBC, I always wanted to be a radio announcer, have my own radio, radio show. So um, I was the kid, despite my stuttering, I kind of live a life of contrasts. Uh, stuttering, yet I was always that kid in the 80s with a tape recorder who recorded, who like forced his friends and you know, cousins to, hey, let's record our own radio show. So when podcasting came to be, uh, it was uh, it was inevitable that I you know start my own podcast. However, I would spend weekends editing out my stuttering. So that would be about two thousand and five, two thousand and six, um, and so I would be what early mid thirties around that time when I learned oh stuttering isn't my fault. I learned about the National Stuttering Association, British Stuttering Association. Wow, there are conferences about stuttering. And that was actually what I was, I had been searching for uh, the previous year in, in 2006. I wanted to find a, a new job. And I figured, I just automatically assumed I have to be fluent. Um, but something stopped me from finding a speech therapist. Um, and I realized it's a support group. I never even thought something like that would happen <laughs> or or would exist you know a support group for people who stutter um and so my podcast so I launched my podcast to meet others who stutter in in Toronto in uh Canada I I wasn't able to find any uh support groups um aside from a Toastmasters group for people who stutter so that was my entry into this Toronto and the Canadian stuttering scene uh, sorry I should be saying 
stammering. It's just a force of habit. Um, and it was inevitable that comics would start seeping in. So um, yeah, so Frankie Banky can see tiny little, little Frankie Banky there. He's a fox who stutters. There's no rhyme or reason why I chose a fox. He was just one of my cartoon characters. I thought, you know what? He will be perfect for a comic strip. And um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so I use, I draw, um, I'm not sure how to formulate my thoughts here. <laughs> it's, it's the pandemic isolation brain here. Uh, I draw my comics. There are a couple of uh, goals I have with my Frankie Banky comics, and that's to educate people who don't stutter um, about what's it like to stutter. Um, I educate people who do stutter, or rather I encourage them to you know, let their stutter now, take steps out of your comfort zone, just like I did, um, to build up that resilience and that desensitization. Hey, I just stutter, something that I do, you know, and um, I don't wanna say it's not a big deal because I know what it's like to be teased about stuttering and grow up stammering. Sorry, I gotta say stammer. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, um, and also to entertain as well because it's a shared experience, you know, drawing these comics with my fellow people who stammer. Yeah, I did the exact same thing. I always thought I was the one that created those tricks and covert tendencies, words, tricking people into saying words for me, you know, doing silly things like describing the place where I live instead of just saying T -t 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 Toronto, you know, things like that. Um, and, uh, and it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun using something that's creative you know it's that's it's my I, I'm communicating with my soul uh and I don't mean that from a avoiding talking um uh avoiding talking <laughs> thing it's just a way of hey here's another way to connect with others and share something that I made with my own hands um and it's been a wild ride you know stuttering open I never knew I would make so many friends around the world uh because I was always one to, I want to travel this and this. Now I have friends who stammer all over the place. So I never have to go to a hotel again. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. And Danny, one thing I watched your film that you made about the, the fox. And one of the points, the, the, four, the four main points you had, and one of them which really struck me was humor and putting people at ease. And that's what you encourage people to do, isn't it? Use humor. Yes. Um, there was a time, uh, like, for example, you know, going to the coffee shop, stuttering my order, and I would get the laugh, you know, the nervous laugh or, you know, and there was a time I'd be like, is there something wrong with my stuttering? But I learned that a lot of people, they just don't know, you know, and that laugh could be a nervous or, you know, they're trying to, like, they're not laughing at you, they're sharing that moment with you. So I just, so I decided I'm just gonna use humor because um, you make a connection through humor and humor is a great educational tool as well. Uh, so I use ridiculous uh, plots in my, uh, in my comics to help educate, uh, you know, those who don't stutter as, uh, as, as well, because humor is more mem memorable as well. And it's also fun, you know, and mm -hmm. let's face it, the world needs some humor, some, pos some positivity. Does. Yeah. It certainly <laughs> does right now. And just somebody just pointing out on the messages here, and uh, as they're quite right, you can say stammer, stutter. And in fact, we interviewed a British guy, a rapper, a British rapper here for our film. And he thought that stutter was an English word and that stammer was the American. So I think we all <laughs> use everything, don't we? Um, Rory Sheridan, tell us about the, uh, the Hiatus Collective. Um, yes, it's so uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, and yeah, many thanks so for, for a lovely introduction. Um, yeah, so that um, Hiatus Collective started um, through an investigation while I was doing, um, doing, doing my sort of photography um, uh, three, three years of a degree. Um, and I was sort of halfway through that degree and kind of um, having. Um, I guess a, a fairly rough time with sort of, sort of my fluency in speech. So halfway through, I think, um, yeah, for the degree I had an epiphany and was thinking, why am I making sort of a photography work about things that I'm not um, particularly interested in and wanted to sort of reflect my own speech and um, how that affects me. So um, I uh, made a, 
um, my final degree show project was um, a quite immersive installation um, with sort of many many people on, on the call today might have taken part in some of the interviews I held and it's sort of aimed to be a visually immersive installation kind of looking at three three aspects of stammering some which are more obvious some which might not be um, so looking at brain functionality, what happens in a block moment of stammering, um, what, um, what's going on in sort of the face and also sort of the, the more hidden side of it. So for a text illustration. Um, so that project was, was really well received. Um, and then I sort of, I kind of walked away from that project and thought, how can I, so how am I able to capitalize and look to, to kind of create a kind of collective action around sort of um, raising awareness of, of, of kind of any, any sort of barriers people have to um, communication. So that's where um, the Hiatus Collective sort of started um, and sort of looking kind of to break um, the flow of a, see, um, a world which has been fairly seemingly fluent, um, both online and, and uh, offline. Um, and it's yeah, all about, so that, it's about that, you said on your, I've read some of what your work and you're talking about new norms and making people more considerate about, about people have, who have issues with speech. It's about not having to be fluent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the collective sort of started with that and it's come kind of full circle. That was quite an early exploration back in sort of 2018 and sort of reading Johnson's book and, um, and what he was saying earlier about um, different, Sort of tentative links that could be made with other sort of speech um, uh, 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 disorders and and sort of how can we make kind of the communication challenges more more kind of deliberate and sort of pronounced in in writing and speech. Um, yeah. And finally, to uh, Helen Russo. Good afternoon. You've uh, you've had lots of coverage uh, in the last few weeks with your your new book, The Boy Who Made Everyone Laugh. Tell us about it. Hi, yeah, I've been, yeah, I have, we've had loads, in fact, so we, I've done lots of stuff with my son, Lenny, who the book was inspired by, um, Lenny has a stammer, and he's also been asked to do lots of, uh, lots of things as well, and he was here, he was in that chair, <laughs> up until about 10 minutes ago, watching it all, and he was really enjoying it, and really enjoying listening to the stuff about creativity, and because he's a he's a drummer and a, a pianist and stuff, but he was loving it. And then uh, and then I said I'm gonna have to turn on my camera and my uh, <laughs> my um, microphone. And then he scarpered. So oh. sorry. I, I think you should get him. I saw him on the BBC. He was terribly confident. In fact, I was amazed how confident he was. I think you should call him back. But anyway, go I on. know. I know. I think it's a bit like Felicity was saying. You. He's never talked about, he's never really talked about it as much as he's had to in the last, or not had to, as much as he's chosen to in the last few weeks. And so I think, yeah, it's, it's I think he just thought, oh, I don't want to talk about my stammer again. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so he's, so he's scarfed, but he was really, really interested in listening to everybody. It was lovely, actually. Um, but yeah, and so my book is, um, it's called The Boy Who Made Everyone Laugh. And it's about um, an 11 year old boy called Billy Plimpton who wants to be a stand-up comedian, um, but he thinks that his stammer is going to get in the way. And so he um, he tries a lot of the things that, that, you know, that some of you have talked about. He doesn't, he avoids things and he and he tries not speaking at all for a, for a long time. And he tries different ways of getting rid of his stammer and, and none of that quite goes to plan. And then, um, I mean, I don't, want to give the end away but I think it's quite important to say that it was really important in the writing of it that he didn't eventually overcome his stammer that was really important and that he overcame a lot but not his stammer he overcame all sorts of confidence the issues that he'd had and, and and stuff that was going on but that it was it was really really key um to me that 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 wasn't what happened um and I think it Obviously, it all came from experience, see, witnessing what Lenny had been through um, and, you know, being with him in speech therapy and, and just seeing how cruel kids can be and how 
and how adults can respond in in bizarre ways when a child stammers a uh, ways that you just I, I've been so shocked and surprised by how adults respond and all of these like what uh, like like repeat more often than not repeating back to him what he says with a stammer so mimicking him I, yeah. I couldn't actually believe that how often that happens so if so in a in a shop if he asks for something and gets stuck somebody would respond and say yeah, yeah, yeah yes of course I will like Joe trying to pop tension and I don't think it's about cruelty that's the thing I, nobody would meet nobody would do that to a child surely you would think but I think it's about noticing that there's a tension noticing that there's some struggle there and wanting to make it okay somehow and and doing that in a way that they think is funny or they think is just lightening it, lightening what they see as a an atmosphere that needs to change. And it's remarkable how many times I've seen that. So how many times mm -hmm. he must have had it when I wasn't there is uh, unimaginable. Um, but so there was all that. And there was also, um, he had never read anything about a character that stammered. The only time, he called me in once where he was reading in bed. It must have been about when he was about probably about seven or eight and his, his stammer was really strong and he was struggling with it at that time. And um, he called me in and he was quite upset and he said, mum, is this okay? He just got to the very end of this book that he was really, really loving. And it said, a character said something and then it said, he stammered like an idiot. He said, mum, is it okay that it says he stammered like an idiot? And I, said, I was kind of like, well, I don't, does it feel okay? And he said, no, it doesn't feel okay. And I was like, well, it's not okay then. So, you know, what, so then he wrote a, an email, he composed this email to the publishers and said, you know, this made me feel bad. I, and I don't know what, I don't think you can do anything, but it makes me feel bad. And, and I'm not sure what, and I was like, you just tell, you've just got to say, if something, people don't know, that's the problem. People just don't know what is making other people feel bad. So unless you say something, so anyway, he got loads of free books in the post, so he was chuffed with that. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so all of these experiences and more um, led to the point where I was like, right, this is a story that that I think I need to write for him. I wanted to write a book for him, and I read every chapter after I'd written each chapter. I read it to him to kind of check in and make sure that I was on the right path and, and then kind of realised, oh, maybe other people might like to read this as well it's uh I'm, I'm not entirely sure how much time i have left i don't think it's very much but you're all so interesting i'm going to keep talking until i'm told not to i'm sure somebody's going to tell me on the message but um um what helen just said has really struck me because one of the one of our interviewees in our film is a rugby player who has never spoken about his stammer until now and he's in his 50s and he makes the point he said you know the way it's portrayed and it's just what you just said then he said it's the way that it, it's portrayed or has been in the past is you know, it's the stuttering fool in literature. And it's what Helen just was pointing out then. And I just think, I wonder how all of you, all our panelists, how you think that you can use your, your creativity, your arts to, to change um, the perception. Because again, it is so hidden very often. It is very hidden. Um, Gina, if I can ask you, first of all, as the, the filmmaker, I mean, what, what can you do? Do you use your, your stutter in any shape or form? Will you use it in the future? Yes, you know, um, so in addition to being a person who stutters, um, I'm also mixed. Um, I am African American and Chinese American. And um, so I grew up watching, you know, lots of um, portrayals of people of color on you know, television, movies, so on and so forth, and people who stutter in the media or, you know, books, films, television. Um, and I always felt that um, what I wanted to do at some point as a filmmaker, as somebody who uh, creates media for people to consume is just to have people be who they are um, on screen. So if there's a character who stutters, for example, don't even really make that the focus point. Don't make that the character's arc. Don't make don't make that like their like total defining characteristic even because most of the movies that I've seen about stuttering, yeah, have been about um, the arc or like overcoming or stuttering is their, their big burden to bear and that's their big defining feature. And um, I think that 
just putting people on screen and like letting them have their race or their disability or whatnot. Um, and just like, you know, letting it exist is really powerful. Um, in the movie that I made, uh, there's a very diverse cast. Uh, the two leads are um, Asian American females. Um, and I just didn't want to make that their defining thing. It was one part of their, their character, but it's really about who these people are it, like inside. And um, I think just having the intention of going in of putting characters on the screen who are different and just letting that be there is kind of revolutionary in itself and I think that in the future I would like to at some point put a character who stutters on the screen and not even mention it just <laughs> feel like oh yeah it's just there like you know nobody even mentions it or it's just like do you stutter or anything nothing no because I think people have to deal with what they see and then they will habituate to it so that's kind of my approach with it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think Rihanna is going to, uh, to join us. I have a feeling. I'm sorry. I'm not... Oh, there she is. I, I haven't been, I've been very lucky during lockdown. I haven't had to use Zoom at all because I have to go into work to do the news. So I'm not very okay with it all. But um, I think Rihanna is going to, I think we actually have run out of time, which is a real shame because you're all absolutely fascinating and uh, wonderful to hear you all. And particularly to, to Danny and to Gina, who I know it's seven o'clock in the morning where Gina is. And I think Danny is probably something similar. So thank you both for getting up so early in the morning. Um, and thank you all for telling you, telling us your stories. It's all fascinating. And uh, it's a very, as I have discovered, a very shared experience, which uh, about something that has been or is still quite hidden. Um, and that has been very revealing. I hope you will watch our film. And to the people who are asking me, um, yes, it will be. Felicity can tell me quickly. Felicity, it is on World Service or on World News at some point, isn't it? It will be on BBC I World, I think, um, slightly later in April. But we can, if you keep an eye out on Twitter, once we know the dates, we can um, tweet it. <laughs> so people who are not here. And there, Felicity, you've survived. There you go. I took, I took all the pressure off you. <laughs> Thank you. So you're a very good producer. I'll work with you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, it's been a pleasure and fascinating. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much for joining us, everybody, and Felicity and Sophie, thank you so much for chairing that round table. It's been absolutely incredible, and thank you to everybody so much already who's taken part. Um, so now we're going to be joined by Madeline. Um, she's an unoccupied batch for violin, partition free prelude uh, by Madeline Jones. She's 13 years old and she's from Bury St. Edmunds in Suffolk and she's a pupil at Purcell School for Young Musicians. So over to you, Madeline. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much. That was incredible and I'm sure everyone will agree as well who's attending. Um, round of applause from all of us. Amazing, thank you. Welcome, welcome back everybody. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to um, Nina G who will be, um, I think she's got something prepared for about a, 20 minutes or so. So we are going to be going over by a bit but um, uh, I promise you it'll be worth while um, spending your time um, listening to Nina. Uh, Nina, um, are you going to put your camera on so we can see you? And um, okay, and uh, I'm going to switch off my mi microphone now and I'm going to hand you over from ni Nina, um, who's um, uh, coming from the west coast of America. And um, yeah, the stage is yours, Nina. All right, thank you so much. And it's really an honor to be here and to close this out. I hope everybody is safe and well. Um, and also I want to apologize to all of you today. Um, I want to apologize that I'm having a very fluent day. I feel that my fluency is wasted on this. Like I would have loved just to, I've been so stuttering a lot during the pandemic. So um, unfortunately having a fluent day. Okay, so I wanted to first start with having, with talking about a gig that I had two weeks ago. The gig was on the street because now we perform comedy on the street where there are tables set up in places where there would be a parking lot um, or where, where the parked cars would be. So there are booths there. I am on Hate Street in San Francisco. Um, if anybody has studied the hippie movement, they will know that Hate Street was the center of the hippie and drug cu culture in San Francisco. So I'm there performing. I was the headliner. And there's a man right across the street who during my entire set is yelling, ba 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 and telling me to shut the F up. And I have been in these situations before in, in, in comedy. I have people ask me for change. They have panhandled while I'm on stage. They, I, I've had fights break out. I've been heckled. I once had someone arrested um, right in, in front of my stage. So I've been used to this. I kept on persevering. I just kept on go going because like I didn't know who this guy was. He wasn't part of the audience. He was just a random intoxicated guy 
right across the street. And the audience responded in a way that I did not expect. They started to tell him to shut the F up and started get, giving him the fifth finger. So the audience who was kind of not the most engaged audience before that got very engaged. And afterwards, I thanked them. And I also told them that as a person who stutters, I've been interrupted a lot in my life. And this guy across the street was not going to throw me because I have been trained to speak through these interruptions. And I think so much of stuttering is a roadmap for us as artists that we know what it feels like to fall down and have to get back up and that is such an important part of art now i wanted to share my screen in just a, a second oh i have a book you guys don't know about my book because you're in the uk and you can only get get it on amazon um, and I'm not able to go tour there. So check out my books, The Stutter Interrupted. And basically, it tells this story about my life and my love of stand up. Um, if you looked around my kitchen, like right here, these are all these comedy albums. I have my picture of Lenny Bruce in the background. I have the cupcake from Cabin Boy. I know no one's gonna understand that, but it's special to me. Um, also, I have a, a porky pig head that I might talk about and I might not. Anyway, my lifelong passion has been stand up. And since I was 11 years old, um, I was so interested in it and I eventually wanted to be a, a, a stand up comic. But for me, Growing up, just like the gentleman er earlier who talked about living in the 80s and having fish called Wanda, and here is a Joe Pesci movie. What's the Joe Pesci movie? Um, you guys know the Joe Pesci movie with the with, uh, with the lawyer who stuttered my my my, my cousin Vinny. That those films did not have the best representation of stuttering. I thought you had to be fluent in order to be a stand-up comic. So my dream died. At 17, my dream died. And this was after I wrote the material that I thought that I might do on stage. This was when I looked up open mics, all of this, my dream died. And it got picked up years later after I attended a conference for pe people who stutter. Because when I was at that conference, I realized how much space I relinquished up to other people, especially at, as a woman, we are so socialized to give other pe people space. And being a woman who stutters, that made a particular impact on me. And by the way, I'm wearing a, 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 a unicorn dress. Um, because I talk about how, and, and this feels weird to push my boobs up against the camera, but um, in my book, I talk about how women who stutter, how we are unicorns, and that when we meet each other, it's very so special. And for me, meeting other unicorns made me reflect on my own life and the choices that I made and the space that I gave over. And I was able to reclaim that space when I got back from that conference. And within six months, uh, I started do doing comedy. And this is where I wanted to share this image. A lot of you know about the iceberg. And the iceberg um, is from Joseph Sheehan, who said that so st stutters oftentimes have feelings of denial, shame, anxiety, guilt, isolation, fear, hopelessness. And yes, I have experienced all of these things. I have felt guilt having people sit through my stutter. I have felt isolation because I didn't know anybody else who stuttered. I felt hopelessness that I would never be a stand-up comic, all of these things. But an iceberg is much like a cloud in the sky that we can look at it in a different way. And for me, 
after meeting other people who so stuttered, after having the kind of community that we have this morning for me, I don't know what time it is there, it's five o'clock or whatever. So today, um, that denial can turn to acceptance, shame into pride, anxiety to kindness, guilt into comfort or forgiveness. And for me to forgive others for some of their the behaviors has been something that I need to do. Fear into courage, hopelessness into hope, and most of all, isolation into community. And it is because of a community of people who so stutter that I was able to get on stage. Now, the thing is, a lot of people here have talked about how they were driven to the arts because it was a form of expression. My form of expression is speech. And part of that is, is because of my love of comedy, but also I have dyslexia. And the written word is not, it's so much less accessible to me than the spoken word. So it was important for me, I should, I meant to stop sharing. I just stopped sharing for me. So there we go. But the spoken word um, way uh, of expressing myself was the most accessible. And I wanted to acknowledge that because it's just not that we stutter, but a lot of us have ADHD, learning to, 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 to disabilities, Asperger's so much. And so I wanted to acknowledge that we have multiple things there. Okay. So a couple things that fluent people say that get on my nerves. I just wanted to get into that a teeny tiny bit. And I say fluent, not, you know, like everybody is disfluent to every once in a while, but I'm, I'm talking about fluent, fluent in terms of their th thinking and their not acceptance of stuttering. So some people will say, oh my God, comedy, that must be so therapeutic for you. Like that must be such a good way to get out your feelings. And yes, it can be. But just because we stutter, just because we might identify as having a disability like I do, doesn't make our art any less. It's not for us. We create art for the world and to show our perspective. So I wanted to say that. Also, a lot of times, um, and I see a lot of people saying that they are inspired by this day. And I think we can inspire each other, but I've also had fluent people come up to me. Like once I did a presentation in a library and this woman came up to me and she said, you are such an inspiration. If I talked like you, I wouldn't talk at all. I was like, not really compliment, not really what I'm trying to inspire. And so sometimes people will tell me, and these are people without the, 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 the disabilities will say, oh, if you could do it, then I can do it too. And it's like, no, I, I'm smarter and funnier and more talented. And so sometimes people will try to put us down or to relate to us in a way that like, oh, you're such an inspiration. And I just want to make sure and make clear that all of us are true artists. And I've been so, I, I've been so happy to see that re, see that re, re, reflected here and how much your resiliency as artists is coming through both in your art and also in how you talk about your art and your experiences. I see art as the act of re resiliency because you fail and you have to get back up. And for us as pe people who stutter, every block, every repetition, every time we get the face, and you guys know the face, like, huh, what's going on here, the face. Every time we get that, we have the possibility or we have the roadmap 
to create and to put that resiliency into our art. And that is exactly what I've seen here. And that perseverance, that all of that re resilience that we've seen in this is something that we can embody. It's something we have experienced ourselves. And it is because of the family, the family of people who stutter. It's because of the family that we're able to create and hopefully inspire change in the world. So with that, I am going to end. If there's any questions, I'd love to answer them, but I wanted to keep on time. So there you go. And also if there are any questions, um, I would love an accommodation and have them read, read out loud. Okay, uh, Nina, um, um, thank you so much. Um, it was a um, um, fascinating talk. Um, it, seems, it seems like you've got a very, very popular book out there. There's lots of, uh, sort of great com comments about your book. Um, and um, yeah, I asked if um, asked if there can be um, um, posted a, um, a link to the Amazon page, and and so that's been pasted. So that's good. Okay. Um, so um, just just um, I know I know we've got a few people in the call who um, host um, um, stand up comedy um, events on Zoom and things. And um, I know that you're, you're a successful comedian in the U US as well. Um, have you got any advice for people who want to um, get into stand up or want to get, get into maybe um, acting as well? What, what's your advice, Nina? Um, I think, real, I, you know, for me, my humor is not about my stutter, it's about other people's reaction to stuttering. And part of that is because uh, I am a student of di di disability studies, which doesn't, which, which sees the problem of having a, a disability as access in the world and the, and, and the b b barriers that we encounter instead of the problem is with us. And I try to remember that when I do comedy, that I'm not making fun of my stutter, although sometimes I might say something, but the jokes that I write really try to target the in access in the world. And I think it's important to be very deliberate about how you th think about your jokes and your material because we are representing the the world of stuttering and um and sometimes flu people want more to feel comfortable and i come from the school of comedy where i want them to feel uh, uncomfortable okay okay thank you um so um, um, Amy's just left a me message on saying, so yes, otherwise it can reinforce the, no the notion that it's okay to laugh at stammering. Okay. Yeah, no, okay. that's um, exactly it. Yeah, okay. Do you, do you ever, uh, do you ever get the wrong reaction from the audience? You know, I have had times, especially early on in my career, uh, that people would laugh at the stutter, and then I would shame them. I'd say, no, you're not supposed to laugh at that part. And, and then they would get uncomfortable and not laugh at anything. Um, so I had to ma ma manage that and also kind of know that people are going through their own process along with my process. Um, but one of the things that helped me there was I listened to Mel Tillis's comedy album, and and it's not that he did stand up, but but musicians always want to be comics, and comics always want to be. Oh, oh no, I didn't mean for you to do it. Listening to him, I heard people laugh 
at his stutter, but I knew these people loved him. And it helped me to hear that and to say, okay, the laughter doesn't have to be a ma malicious thing and like get the laughing out with me so they don't have it with other pe people. Okay. 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 Thanks. Yep. Yep. And um, finally, I'll just read the last com comment from um, Anita. Um, it's not okay to laugh at stammering or people who stammer. However, we do wind up in funny situations and stupid people. Maybe she means as with stupid people, but yeah, um, I agree, yeah. Okay, okay, well, so thank you uh, very much for uh, sort of getting yourself out of bed at some ungodly hour, Nina, to uh, join us today. Um, if, if, I can, um, if I can ask um, um, Patrick, and uh, Rianne to um, come back on their vid videos again. Um, we're going to uh, wrap up for the day. Um, personally, um, I've just got a few few things to say. Um, obviously, I, we showed you the vi videos of the, uh, the two charities that we're collecting for. Um, I'll just put again a copy of the Just Giving page um, into the chat box. So if you can donate, uh, that'll be wonderful. Um, I've noticed that there are a few don donations going into the, um, um, onto the Just Giving page, which is great. And thank you very much. Um, last couple of things for me is that obviously um, uh, we're part of the Cambridge Self-Help Group. Um, please uh, so do try and get involved in Self-Help Group uh, wherever you live in, in the UK or in the world. Um, if you want to contact any of us again if you search online for Cambridge Stammering um, you'll be able to find us and um, finally I want to give um, maybe you can clap or may maybe you can wave but um, I want to give a big round of applause to Rianne who's been absolutely awesome with doing all of the tech for this afternoon so big round of applause for Rianne okay well, well done Rianne thank you guys and um, I'm sorry there were a few technical pictures but it's the I, I blame the clo uh, the global pandemic for everything so it was that yeah <laughs> we almost managed to do the whole thing without mentioning the dreaded c word i anyway. know i had to right at the end right at the end okay uh, <laughs> patrick do you want to wind up yeah i just want to say thank you for all of our artists for coming and, and giving their time and energy to talk talk to us i've i've really enjoyed it and had a great time um rianne has dealt very well with the chaos behind the scenes which i guess you guys don't see but has really added to the thrill of the event um and i think that i'm going for a large bottle of wine after this <laughs> <laughs> the event has 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 stammered like the people in it and for some reason Paul has popped up so let's just let him have the last word because that's the way things seem to be going at the moment. Over to you Paul. <laughs> All right this is unexpected but it's been great fun and uh, thank you all of the main organisers behind the scenes you've you done a, um, a, um, a fantastic job. It, it's been great fun. Thank you. Um, okay. I've just read one of the comments as well in the chat, and the same one's the next one. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I know I know we have mentioned about maybe making it annually. Um, not sure if it'll be stammering in the arts. It might might be stammering and something else. But, um, but um, I'm sure that we'll be back again. We've got a very, very um, passionate and enthusiastic um, group in Cambridge. So, so yeah, um, hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Okay, um, that's it for us. Uh, goodbye from Cambridge and uh, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.